Ken Wag. Um, and we are off and running. That was quick. Good morning, Mr. McGregor. Hi. How are we doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. No, I can see Paris in the background. What else? Yeah, no idea. Got? What else have we got in the background? You can see Paris. What's behind? New York. You? I think I think the rest of New York. Very nice. And you're currently sitting in the wonders of Dubai. Yeah. Good stuff. Welcome to a brand new podcast called, uh, we'll call it the world of space design and build. Where <laughs> we're going to bring elements of experiences and advice um, of what me and my guests have been up to, certainly in the past year, because things have changed quite a bit, haven't they, sir? So it is a little bit different from the last time we met. Yeah, a little bit different. Yeah. So probably about four years ago we first met. And one of my one of my greatest kind of or my my most fun experiences of making phone calls and getting to the right person. To which I spoke to about six British people and then I ended up speaking to you. Yeah. Um, for, a, for a great project that we did together on Nokia. So again, um Many thanks indeed for that, and and since then we've kept in touch. What have you been up to in the past year? Uh, past year, spent a lot of time locked down, working remotely, all that sort of stuff, like the rest of the world. Um, but yeah, it's it's coming to life a little bit again now. Working, obviously, got jobs in Dubai, the rest of the UAE, and then obviously looking at branching out a little bit into Saudi, uh, Egypt, Morocco, uh, and. Where, where the work will take us. There's anything that's a, an interesting challenge. Well, the world's a smaller place now, isn't it? Especially when with the fact that we're doing this. I mean, you could be sitting in time zone aside, you could be sitting in Australia or New Zealand. So, you know, it's yeah. uh, probably helping the situation. Um, give us a quick introduction of who you are and, and, and what you do to present. Uh, yeah, so I've been in construction for about 13 years, uh, spent six in New Zealand, uh, a bit of time of that in Papua New Guinea, it's about three or four years in the UK, and the remainder here in, in Dubai in the Middle East. Um, yeah, project management's essentially been, been the, the bulk of it, worked on everything from base build, uh, more focused on fit out in the UAE region, but yeah, done everything from stadiums and science centers, residential developments, uh, and now more in the office commercial fit out side of things. Okay. Um, you've transitioned over the past 12 months as well um, from different organizations. What's kind of the difference between the key accounts that you were doing before and what you're doing now? Yeah, so it was previously JLL, uh, big, obviously, massive American-based uh, multinational, very similar to what where I am now. I'm at Savills. Um, yeah, JLL is probably, the, I mean, I don't think there's a part of the construction world that JLL don't touch. Um, that they are, they are the they do everything. Um, Sam was a, a little bit more focused, a little bit different. It's a much smaller team. Um, yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a new challenge. Good stuff. I mean, I do not want to be spending the next set of 30, 40 minutes talking about COVID, but it's very hard to avoid it. Um, we're in a part of the world where uh, I work with multinational organizations. You've been doing that for since we knew each other and, and well before that. How do you think it's affected multinationals way of thinking when it comes to the commercial office space are they reducing are they increasing what's the kind of trend that you're seeing yeah there's a, it's definitely a case by case there's not so much of a general trend obviously some some businesses have benefited from from covid where some have some have contracted so um we're working on a project with uh Reckitt Benkiser who are responsible for things like Dettol so obviously Cleaning regimes are, are now more apparent and more to the forefront. So, so their their offices they're moving to a new office, as you would have done two years ago. So, so they're in the realms of not not a lot has changed for them. Um, a lot of some companies are doing more of the renovations in house where they are. Um, saves a little bit of capex just by renovating their existing space or downsizing within their existing space than, than springing for the capex of moving. I guess part of that will be the uncertainty about what the world's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it will be the, the sort of availability of the funds to do it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's things like that. Um, the other thing that I'm sort of more focused on as well is the sustainability side. So things like lead well, well health safety, all those sorts of things become a bit more apparent when they start talking about the well-being of staff 
mental health, uh, environmental quality, all that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think it's something that the stereotype of multinationals could be, not all the time, but could be that um, decisions or processes take a long time to implement. With the fact that COVID has has obviously happened and we're you know knee deep in into it and, and the, you know over the last year, say 15 months, a lot of processes, health and safety, well-being for the staff, they've been implemented relatively quickly in the grand scheme of things. Um, certainly when the return to work uh, started, started to occur. Um, the well-being is an interesting one. I, I heard a statistic minor tangent but i heard a statistic about online um shall we say e-commerce percentages and within a six month period it went from approximately 18 percent to 40 percent now if you then and, and so what they've done is they sort of expedited over a 10-year period um the, the value of e-commerce purchasing do you think that will have the same kind of effect on working from home i think is an obvious answer people will now take advantage um, remote management using Zoom, and then of course things like health and well-being. Do you think that that will? It's now going to kickstart multinationals into really looking at ergonomics, lead, and, and health and well-being in a big, big way in 2021. Yeah, I, I personally, I hope so. I think it's the the right way to go. People, the the drive in people now, and the staff, and and people coming out of universities and the education they're coming through with is flexibility is key. Whether that's flexibility of hours, flexibility of working location. Uh, and also the quality of that working location. Gone are the days of going to an office and spending 10, 12 hours sat in a cubicle, not seeing the outside world. The, the offices will change, and, and we talked before about, is it going to be because of social distancing or is it going to be the change in work styles? I think there's a, a definite, when we started the work from home, there was a lot of people, a lot of senior management that were very nervous about it because I'm not going to be able to see my team. I'm not going to be able to sort of, monitor who's doing what who's where and what's going on and a lot of that drifted away when they realized you know what the world's still turning everyone's still progressing you're still getting the output things are still happening and that was sort of the initial four weeks where was like, oh yeah this isn't too bad and then it's when you lose the flexibility the other way of i need to go into the office i really need to have a chat with someone it's just that little bit more difficult so i think where we've we've kind of gone full circle has been a lot of learning we've now realized work from home is something that is functional it is achievable it is doable uh, but I, it's not the future of working i don't think anyone's really sitting there going you know what i don't need an office anymore i'll just send everyone to work from home because and one person uh, pointed out to me it's it's fine when you're working with your existing team and COVID happens and for four weeks the guys that you know and have worked with for a year two years ten years are working from home but what happens when you have a graduate intake how does how does someone new become part of Savile's team how do they build relationships how do you understand who is the personality that works well in a team and you want to promote them and this that and the other there's an element of human interaction that for a million different reasons we'll always need so I think it will change the way offices are set out I don't the, the size and scale of the offices may change I think it will be a lot more almost university-esque where you have points of congregation where people will come together on a basis and they'll come in for a couple of hours they'll work in a collaborative space in a collaborative way and then they may disappear home so you may end up spending two or three days at home the the rest in the office or you might be a blend of half a day at home half a day in the office and you, you match it accordingly i don't see offices vanishing I, I, it just the long-term function of teams and human interaction doesn't really work on that basis in my opinion i think there has to be that flexibility and fluidity in it. There's, there's so many so many circumstances that you've got to take into consideration. I mean, we started talking about the office space and working from home. So I agree with you that you're definitely going to need to have a base. You're definitely going to need to have somewhere to work from. And that allows that human interaction. You also look at different generations will have different perceptions or um, I would find it easier to work from home, whereas someone that has been in an office with a desk, they've sat in the same space, um, the, the stereotypical office that is, uh, for the past 20 years, um, all of a sudden they've been thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool in which they're told they cannot, they, they cannot follow their routine. You know, get on the tube, get in a car, on a train, 
and go into an office and sit there for 10 hours a day. So there's, there's the generational thing as well. But you've also got the logistics. You're right in which you say maybe three days a week you can work from home or you can work flexibly. And the other two days a week, you've got to come in. The difficulty is where you try and blend a day. You know, if you say you want to go in for a couple of meetings and you only need to go in for two or three hours, the tendency, I don't think, would be, and certainly this is different in different parts of the world, the tendency is not going to be to go in for two or three hours and then go home again. Because how long did it take you to get there? You want to go somewhere, you want to be based in a location for eight to 10 hours or six hours, but at least spend a decent amount of time doing whatever work and having that location. Now you have pods, you've got meeting hubs, you've got collaboration areas, you've got closed meeting rooms, you've got focus rooms, you've got phone booths. You know, these are the new kind of ways of working that we're talking about. And we, we were even going into sort of hot desking. And now hot desking is under question because of you can to reduce touch points. So there's so many things need to be taken into consideration there's not a one size shoe fits all as you said each company will have a different opinion a different perception a different way of working which where does it stop where does it start and, and where does it stop yeah it's, it's a difficult one I, I saw an article recently that the the head of uh, i think it was goldman sachs came out and said that working from home was an aberration that he will look to fix as soon as he can so it's a generational thing and there's companies who who they, 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 they're known for working people hard and people work hard and they, they work 12, 14 hours a day and, it, and it's long hours and you sit there and you do get ground out. And, and yeah, the, and you can do that. And it is that flexibility. If you are someone who, I mean, there's also companies who've said you never have to come back to the office. Spotify. Spotify is one of them. Yeah, there's, a few, there's a few now that have come out and said it, and that's fine. You never have to, but you can. There will be an office. And like you say, that <laughs> I, 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 I'm the same. I, I wouldn't want to work from home every day of the week. But when you've got kids, there's a benefit to being able to work from home. There's also the benefit of being having a place to escape and go to an office. Um, and, and, but if you have the flexibility of hours that you know what, you can do the school run, et cetera, et cetera, work from home till work from uh, drop them at school go to the office leave the office at two o'clock pick the kids up from school work from home for a few hours that sort of flexibility i think makes a huge difference to a lot of people because mm -hmm. especially in covid the logistics around family units especially working from home if you've got a husband and wife or partners working from home two people working from home can be quite a challenge no. depending on the size of your home did you buy a home with the allowance for two different separate working spaces and all that sort of thing and then kids come into it so you, everything is about flexibility the flexibility and how you work where you work all those sorts of things it's just i think offices now it went from being you've got 100 staff so you've got 100 workstations and you've got a bunch of meeting rooms you've got a place to sit and have lunch and that used to be it and then collaborative spaces came in, meeting room pods, phone booths, all these things come in. And it, and like you say, about the generations, I mean, like you say, there's people in the, the working environment who started out in those cubicles we talked about where everyone had their own little office or had their own little cubicle and you go in 10, 12 hours a day. And now you've got guys coming out of university who will sit in a beanbag in a coffee shop with some headphones on, don't really <laughs> care about the structured environment. They're so flexible and able to connect that it doesn't really matter to them. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a very difficult environment to to do what we do in because you go to stakeholder meetings and the CEO might say one thing and as as you come down the, the age brackets or the education brackets, you're like oh no one's agreeing on this they're not it's not going to be if someone's got a very rigid view at the top and people are wanting to put flexibility and then it just it gets challenging. It's um, you know when you watch. Uh when you watch like American movies in, in particular, and you see these kind of office environments, or let's say the like government environments, and they are literally sitting in cubicles. Um, yeah. you, know, you think about the Matrix back in the day, um, some government movies, and they're sitting in high partition cubicles. And the, the kind of stereotypical, I wouldn't say this will be the, the case going forward, but I'll use it as an example, that when people say the word Hoover, it's a brand, but you understand what they're talking about. When people say a Google office, I want a Google office. It's mm. this bean bags, it's this foosball table, pool table, you know, collaboration space, and there's virtually zero desks in and around yeah. the area. Now, obviously it depends on the sector. If you're looking at the legal and the accounting sector, the financial sector, they still have to have 
a, mm. an element of desks and, and an element of closed areas. If you're looking at the sort of um, technology sector, I think technology and software is really where that you know that kicked off the sort of Silicon Valley mm. you know, type um, type office. It's um, it's going to be an interesting time. It's going to be an interesting time for landlords because there's going to be an abundance of space available um, in which people are still sitting on the fence at the moment. Are you finding that there's a lot of people cautious about making decisions about renewals, about moving, and about, as you said at the start of the conversation, spending that capex because they're not sure what to spend the capex on? Yeah, I, I was had a conversation yesterday with someone who's responsible for, for leasing for a number of buildings in Dubai. And what they said was previously you'd have tenants who break clauses and reviews would pass and, and, and they wouldn't even mention it. And it just kind of went, whereas now they're, they're at the point they've got, I think they've got something like 180 leases this year in the remainder of this year that are coming up for sort of just break and renew clause negotiations. And like, that doesn't even include tenants moving in. No. And this, that, this. So the, the workload around, and uh, yeah, and maybe it's it's just one of these market swings where it's, it's gone from being uh, similar to house markets, it's a buyer and a seller's market. It's now it's gone from being a landlord market to a tenant market where tenants are, landlords are having to work a lot harder at looking at negotiations, flexibility. What can we do to retain you in the space? Because yeah, it's become a much more competitive market. Um, and tenants are now much more savvy and they're getting pressure from head office about how much are you spending on rent? Why are you spending that much? Why have you got so much space? We've proved we can work from home and all these sorts of things. Why don't we take a cheaper space? I mean, in Dubai, there's there's requirements around um, how, how many how much space per visa and that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's a, yes. a more difficult negotiation around just disappearing offices. But you can still move to a cheaper part of town if you don't need people to work in the office. And why don't we just have a, a blank empty space somewhere in a cheaper part of town? So, I mean, there's, yeah, I think it's similar to the COVID learnings. I think the leasing market will will look, come through this and there'll be swings and roundabouts, but I think it'll get back to being in a, a similar steady position. But at the moment, everyone is still doing that learning of what exactly does this mean for, we've had the, what does this mean for the work environment? And now it's, what does it mean for the actual office location environment? And will there be, moves within the cities moving from this area to that area because people are now working from home more so we don't need to be in the center of london we can move more to the outskirts become more accessible to people living outside london and this sort of thing so yeah it's it's changing everything from the way people interact and behave to how cities are formed and everything in between so exactly being in the city center and having people visiting you is no longer a necessity so then therefore the, lo the location is no longer as important as it used to be yeah. it's a bit like you were talking about some projects that you're working on morocco djibouti uh you know african north north african mina region the mina region the world is much smaller of course but the mina region where we're based you have regional managers those regional managers can be far more productive uh, doing Zoom calls and, they, and, and obviously more cost effective rather than jumping on flights to visit relevant locations. Um, let's touch on sort of project management side of things because from our perspective, we act prior to, to what, what happened with the pandemic. We were actually managing a project, you were managing a project from Dubai and you came to Qatar twice. So you already had that methodology and I'm sure you did the same within Saudi. And that's probably going to be enforced even more so now with, let's say, time-lapse cameras. You're looking at four-dimensional scanning, so you can do the walkthroughs on the site, which is what we as an organization want to, want to utilize and want to um, kind of implement for the benefit of PMCs such as, such as yourselves. Um, how do you think that will evolve over the next couple of years? Uh, do you think that sort of lack of travel necessity is going to become the norm as well? Um, I, th I think there's always an element of people wanting people on site. The, the boots on the ground is, is always desirable, but there is still the element in lots of places where, especially in Dubai and in the Middle East, where your clients may be based in America or the UK, and, and they've gone from that one, one or two visits a project to not actually being able to come out at all. So the, the development of that, the scanning, 3D walkthroughs, to be honest, is definitely a benefit to the construction industry. It's probably wound us on a few years in the space of eight months, 
where as you'd a year and a half ago never really seen 3d walkthroughs and for and the, the scans and all these sorts of things and now i've got two or three projects that i'm running currently where on a weekly basis the client is sitting and either walking through in a and walking through the actual live footage update scans of the building or they're looking at the design development through a 3d walkthrough and it makes it and the, it makes it easier for the client we sit and look at drawings all the time but for people who don't necessarily grasp the drawings the same way as the construction industry do it's really difficult sometimes to sit in a room sit in a room side by side and say all oh, right we're doing this here and this will look like this and here's a sort of static render image Whereas if you can walk them through the front door of their office, basically walk them through the hallways, through the meeting rooms, to their desk and that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's made design approvals an awful lot faster for us, to be honest, because the client feels much more engaged, much more involved and much more comfortable that their designers and contractors and project managers aren't just running away with their project and they'll just hand them the keys at the end. So it's, I think it's, it's been great for us, to be honest. Uh, it's it's funny because it, it happens in the industry and, and it's fairly a, a, an open and honest conversation. You know, if, if you're sending um, daily reports or you're sending weekly reports with still images, you can orchestrate those images to show the client whatever you want to show them. Whereas when you've got the transparency of a three, four dimensional scan and walkthrough on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis, depending on the, the duration of the overall program, there's nowhere to hide. And then further to that, you add things such as augmented reality, which is what we've done uh, recently for another multinational client who was even more so. It was within the pandemic. Um, there were stakeholders in London, Amsterdam, uh, New York, uh, mainly Dubai, and a couple of users of, of, the, of the client in, uh, in Qatar. Um, but the PMC themselves were also in Dubai. There was no one represented. So the, all we had to go on during that pandemic was technology. When you mm -hmm. implement a three-dimensional augmented reality view and combine that with the three-dimensional and four-dimensional scan, it gives them the vision rather mm -hmm. than a still render. And it gives them the reality of how it is forming over a weekly or probably a, a fortnightly basis to show the difference between scan number one and or the before scan and the after scan. Um, yeah. And I think this is gonna become, I won't say the norm, um, but I think from multinational perspective and stakeholder management, I think it's gonna become far more popular. And it's a simple comparison. You compare what you spend on individual time or multiple individuals, flights, accommodation, allowances, etc., versus the cost of a scan that goes into the overall project budget that will allow, obviously, some cost savings to be made, it's not even down to cost because the cost is, is actually a benefit. It means that they are being productive in their location without having to spend four or five days away from, away from their desk or away from family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm hoping that it's, that's going to go uh, further forward. Do you think that's something that the PMCs will start to increase the, the, the necessity of or the requirements of? Yeah, I, I don't see it. It's, it's one of these things that's come out of COVID. It's not going to go away. I don't know why a company, like you say, would say, you know what, I don't want to spend $1,000 on, on the 3D imaging side. I want to spend $15,000 sending a person there to then come back and at the end of the day, they're still just reporting secondhand information. Whereas if you do a three dimensional scan, that information can be sent to a thousand people. One person doing a site visit is still only one person seeing what's going on. Mm. Um, whereas the, the image files and the walkthroughs that can be sent out, you could send it to, if you're Google, you could send it to every employee in the, in the company if you want to. Yeah. Um, and then, and it, and it helps engagement, it helps employees. If you, the diff, one of the difficulties in stakeholder management is not not everyone in the company is going to be in the room when you're talking about design what's going on what's happening what are the updates but a five minute video or two minute video can be sent out once a week and everyone knows exactly what's going on everyone knows exactly what it looks like and everyone's on, on board with it so yeah it, it's it's taken it's one of the bigger complications in state on the stakeholder side and it just takes away all the issues as you say there's nowhere to hide it's a if it's a 4d scan of the actual building, what's actually happening, what's actually going on, then it's it's fact. This is exactly it's like you're all standing in the room. Great. So yeah, I I, I think it's only going to get better. And to be honest, it 
the construction industry for a long time has always been a long way behind when you look at advances in technology and things like that. BIM modeling took a long time for BIM to sort of get engaged. It's like, what, what's the holdback? You're paying more money, yes, but you basically then have a building that is up to date, exact data. I mean, I've done projects in New Zealand where they didn't know what holes were in what walls and shear walls had had people just randomly cutting holes and no one knows what the fan coil states are in it. Well, you, you have a system. We have the, the technology exists in other industries that sometimes construction is just a bit slow to absorb. So yeah, to implement them, uh, you know, you, you go from, <clears throat> you go from the sort of the stakeholder, let's call it the stakeholder analysis or the, the stakeholder management. I think with multinationals, the larger organizations, they, they can't avoid having more stakeholders involved in the process because everyone wants to have their opinion. So if you have six, eight, 10 stakeholders because of different departments, it's not just their department that they want to have an opinion on, it's the overall uh, project. And you're absolutely correct in what you've said. If that video or that scan is available for people to to see and to view, the project manager, the internal project manager for the client has an easier, relatively easier process or job by advising the stakeholders, they've got a 48 hour window to come back with comments. Those comments are then collated. The report is then sent to contractor or project management consultant to then administer those comments. So while all of the negativity has gone on over the past year or so, it's fast-tracked a lot of the technology items or it has highlighted a lot of the problems within, let's call it interior construction and design and build that, that we've been a part of or are a part of. Um, and it's hopefully resolving some, some issues and it's resolving time. You know, that procrastination, that decision-making is probably one of the most frustrating things from a contractor or design and build pers uh, perspective and also a project manager because there's a set window of that program in which you, you have a design development period, you have an execution period, testing and commission and handover. And if the design development or decision-making is taking longer, then the whole, the whole program shifts. So it leads me on to my next part, which is the project collaboration. We know about the design, we know about the site review, which we've just discussed. What's your thoughts on the project collaboration and approvals? Because once again, gone, I'm hoping, are the days in which, certainly in this part of the world, as you will know, everything has to be a physical piece of paper. Everything has to be stamped and, and physically signed. And if you have stakeholders in multiple countries, uh, that's not feasible. You know, couriers are not as readily available in the Middle East as they would be going from Manchester to London, for example, or uh, Edinburgh to Glasgow. It's, it, it has to be online collaboration and online approvals. Um, we've used it in a couple of projects. It's worked very well. It has a, a record, it's time stamped, it's all drawing based, you have drawing annotations. Do you think that, and I'm not necessarily talking about BIM because BIM is from the ground up and that needs to be implemented from day one. So you have asset registers at the, at the, at the back end and you've got that location planning for where the services are behind the walls. I'm purely talking about administration. I'm purely talking about the approvals, so there are records, and it doesn't have to take seven days. It takes seven hours for it to be issued on a flow to party one, party two, party three, so that each of them approve it simultaneously and the project can move forward. How do you think that's gonna affect things going forward, having online approvals? Uh, I think it's similar to the work from home where previously people were very reluctant to fully trust online approvals, online signatures, all that sort of thing. Um, to the point I've, I've had a client historically who I was, it was a base bill project. There was something at like 1200 contract instructions that I had to physically, I'd issued electronically and everyone had them. And then the client turned around and asked me for the physical copies. I had to print off 1200 <laughs> instructions and deliver a mountain of files that they could store. And it, so there's the, the move from the, yeah, the technology exists, then you've got the duplication because no one fully trusts it, which is probably where we were before COVID. So you'd be yeah. you're printing stuff off and scanning it and signing it and scanning it again. So it's scanned and all that sort of stuff. And 
I think that I mean the documentation management things like A Connect have existed for years, and yeah. like you say, you submit it, it's time stamped. It's a, there's a chain followed, and and it's so simplistic. There's no real need for physical signing of paper. I have had I had one issue during COVID where I needed someone to sign something. Oh, I can't sign it. Why? Well, I don't have a printer. Do you not have, an, e do you not have an, an electronic version of your signature? No. Didn't know how to do it. I'm like, oh my word. I don't, I just don't even know what, like, during COVID, do, you, do I need to print this off and drive to your house with a pen and have you sign totally, it for stuff? So, totally distance, hand it over. Yeah, exactly. Hand it through a window and all that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this stuff has existed. It's not new. It's, it's a very easy thing to do. Lots about construction is difficult, but electronic documentation management has been being done globally in other industries for a very long time. I don't think anyone needs to put pen to paper or a stamp to paper anymore. It's just not the future. I mean, before you even start talking about the environment of printing paper for, for no printing documents, it's just a waste of time. I, I don't have any paper on my desk. I, at all no. really i mean occasionally print programs and things like that because they are easier to read because you need a screen yeah an absolutely enormous screen but typically i don't have paper on my desk That's all. You, if you've got two screens one for your email and one for your working or one to compare and one, yeah. to, one to edit it's you spend the money on on a screen call it 750 dirhams reals or whatever it needs to be a couple of monitor arms and and a sit stand desk you know um yeah. It's it, we're, we're in a world in which we're going generic, uh, sort of a, a generic statement of we're in a world where things are just going much faster. Um, I think we're of a similar age. I think you're slightly, slightly younger. I think you've still got a three. I think you've still got a three in your age. Um, but back in sort of, you know, you asked, you have this sort of the, the joking, you know, what did we do without certainly out in this part of the world? What did we do without mobile phones? What did we do without email? You know, and, and it sounds a little a bit silly to say it, but eventually we're going to get to a stage where the physicality of something isn't required. You know, mm. never mind the environmental impact on trees and various things like this by not having to print off 1,200 engineers' instructions, for example. The logistics of saving things, the travel, the environment. You know, the environment is going to is going to benefit to to an extent with la less travel and people not going to work as often and so on and so forth. Um, when you look at how fast the world ha is, has been and is becoming, wh where does it stop? Because if you're doing online approvals, you're working from home, you're doing four dimensional scanning, your o and manuals are all gonna be electronically and digitally uh, categorized. They're gonna be held on a construction cloud. Um, there's no more binders and folders civil defense or, or Dubai civil defense and Qatar civil defense documents should no longer be lost. And then of course you implement the BIM modeling from A to Z and everything is accurate. Where do you go next? It's not gonna happen in, in six months irrespective of COVID, but even in five years time for this part of the world, it's gonna be a you know, hundred times better, unfortunately because of what's happened. But then where does it then go? You know, where, where do you where do you start when you become as efficient as possible? Um, will will multinationals start to reject it? Will there be generations that will start to reject it? I, I don't know, but I personally am quite excited about it because it just makes everyone uh, far more efficient. We're getting so much more done now. Zoom calls, Teams chats, Google meetups, ten minute meeting, fifteen minute meeting. Um, I just think it's while it's been such a negative time in the past year, we've got to try and pull the positives um, out of it. And uh, no doubt the accountants are going to be rubbing their hands together because their KPIs are save the company money. And those those uh, those clauses, those break break clauses, are definitely going to be acted upon um, in in 2021. It's a bit of a we'll deal with it now, and then we'll handle the situation later if we need if we need more space. Um, What's uh, what's 2021 looking like um, for you? What's going to keep you busy? Yeah, we've we've got a few a few projects, that, and the, one of the interesting things actually that's happening in Dubai, and, and probably Qatar is coming to the same sort of point. And coming from Scotland, everything around us is very very old and very very established. Whereas 
here, there's parts of Dubai, I'm, I'm doing a project currently where we're renovating the internal common areas and things like that and, and the chillers of the building because they've reached that 15 year lifespan. Mm. But the problem is when you look at Dubai, when you look out the window and tag everything that's at a 15 year end of lifespan, you're like, there's a lot of buildings. There's a lot. An awful lot of Dubai has, is, a, is around that age. So it's gonna come, there's quite a, yeah, there's quite a, a turning point for Dubai coming up about building owners are now going to get confronted with what do I actually do? What do I do with this building? Do I need to, because in the time that they've, they've built the building and owned the building, things like lead and well have come about and the environment's much more at the front of people's thinking. COVID's now come about. What are people doing with office spaces? It's, it's a, yeah, it's a challenging market mm. on all fronts. And then you've got all those things put into it and it's, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of buildings. who I think in Dubai are going to, have to be investing in the, the infrastructure because people are not as willing to accept the fact that they're queuing in massive queues for lifts. Um, the facades are a bit leaky, so the AC is not quite as good and the, all these sorts of things, the power, power supply to the building is not quite up to scratch. They probably need to do an upgrade and all these sorts of things. So Dubai grew really, really quickly, which it, it did incredibly well, but it's, it's just now got to that point where actually huge portions of Dubai are of the same age and have the same expiry date for the, the setup that they have. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of work, I think, in Dubai, maybe less so on the actual office fit outs and maybe around more looking at the building itself, common yeah, areas, lifts, chillers. Yeah, the infrastructure in the building itself. Yeah. All coming to that probably needs a rethink. I mean, you, you, you're right. I mean, you look at, uh, you look at the, the, the power consumption, you look at the efficiency of the chilled water and air purification. So again, health and, and well-being. You look at lead and the materials. You look at the health and safety, which is also going to be a huge thing. You look at the social distancing because of COVID. Are there going to be one-way systems in the office? Are they going to have to be panels, uh, separation panels? We even implemented automated doors with uh, access passes. So you're reducing the amount of touch points. You look at the ergonomics. Um, people requiring that flexibility, whether it's sit stand desks, monitor arms, keyboard trays, um, looking at the impacts, you know, musculoskeletal disorders, um, various you know, various aspects like you know like that. Uh, technology, how is that implemented? Um, reducing the infrastructure, data infrastructure in particular. You used to have two points per person, you've now got one point per person. It goes back to that question of where does it stop? It's always about efficiency and if you it's not just a case of how much space i mean i, I had a conversation with a, a client uh earlier this week and they came to me and said oh we we need two floors uh we're expanding i think i've done three offices for them in the past 12 years and they said we now need two floors and i said okay two floors of what i said what one building might be a thousand square meters and another building might be 500 square meters i said so how do you know you need two floors and secondly, let's say it's a thousand square meters. So let's say you've got 2000 square meters. Where did the 2000 square meters come from? Where was the analysis? Where was the, the brief? Let's sit down, let's go through how many people actually need to be in the office. How many meeting rooms are required? What do you use the meeting room for? You know, basically space consultancy. So there's too much of this, or oh, let's reduce space or let's increase space and not enough thought into something that's such a, a capex and of course an opex requirement. So we're talking millions of dollars over what would you say is an average commercial lease? At least three years. Mm. We're spending, let's say 2000 square meters, you've got at least a three year to five year lease, five years with a three year break clause. That's millions of dollars of an investment for people to not take anything into consideration with regards to the actual space that they need. So you as an, an individual turn around to your client and say, well, let's work on that. And if you only need 1,500 square meters, look at that Look at that cost saving. Look at what you're actually putting in your back pocket over that three to five year period. And then you can reinvest that into ergonomics, lead, well, health and safety, COVID, social distancing, technology, software, <laughs> various, various things like this. And this is what excites me about, about the industry. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's, it, yeah, gone are the days where a client can easily rock, rock up to you and say, I've got 80 staff, so I need 80 desks, and I need 
10 meeting rooms and this and, that and the other there's there is a piece to be done like you say before you get anywhere near talking about what spaces you need it's there's a much more basic understanding of how do you work how are you going to operate what is it you do who interacts with who how do they interact what it's more about facilitating rather than just saying yeah i have 80 staff i need 80 desks and i need four meeting rooms and, and, and that sort of thing so yeah that yeah it, and this is part of the reluctance that we find at time to time here is is there's a number of projects where we've sort of been engaged or even the design has been engaged or the designers engaged first then the project manager comes on or the clients let a space and then they've got someone on you're like it would have been great if you'd had us on three or four months ago so that, <laughs> so that the cost manager could have given you a cost estimate as to how much it's going to cost you to do this before yeah. you've got a designer who's two three months into design and suddenly you're like oh yeah okay so you've fallen in love with the design that you we've now told you you can't afford actually it's probably functionally not really what, what you need so yeah it's 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 difficult because completely understandably if you if you a lot of not all companies have have a real estate head or someone who's sort of from the construction industry who knows the, the sort of flow of the works who need to get on first if someone said i need to need to redesign or refit my office the first thing a lot of people go is Oh, okay. We'll get a designer on board. Now. Yeah, but how does the design? The designer doesn't necessarily know how your budget's going to work. They'll work with you on the functionalities and all that side of things. But there's the element of yeah, but that needs to tie into cost. It needs to tie into the programming of it because the other thing you get here is a lot of people look at their lease renewals six to eight months before that break clause. Yeah. Well, the problem is that typically a project in Dubai takes six to eight, eight months, months or sort of six months at six months is fast <laughs> given approvals design and all that sort of thing so okay we spent two months talking about it we need to be out in four months we're well, not going anywhere in four months there's nothing nowhere is going to be ready for you so yeah it's 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 difficult the like, thing with new companies graham it's the same with new companies that they'll come and say oh we've got a lease we want to go into this office we've got two months grace period and we want to be in in a month I'm, yeah i'm, I'm sorry it's a, and and that's Listen, there's a saying that I like to use that, that one of my mentors, Rob Moore, you don't know what you don't know. So if you've got startups and you've got organizations that are not within PMC design and um, uh, construction or interior design and build, then they're not necessarily going to know. And that's our responsibility collectively yeah. to try and do things like this and educate them in which they should be looking at the, what is it, plan to fail and fail to plan. You know, let's plan a year in advance or 18 months in advance of knowing that the break clause is coming or knowing that we're going to have to move office for whatever reason. It's a bit like doing your budgets. Why would you do your budgets in January of the year that you've just started your, your budget? You need to be doing your budgets in Q3 for the yeah. following year. You know, let's, let's plan. Uh, and it's up to us to try and, you know, guide people in, in the right direction. But yeah, those... Um, yeah, you'll never. That's probably one thing that you will not change overnight. Is that there's so many things going on uh, to, to to try and consider space being one of them. Um, that to try and get in as early as possible and speak to these people and advise them um, is something that we're we're both keen to do. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's 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 the difference between in in a lot of industries a year is an incredibly long time, whereas in construction. A year is not a year disappears like you wouldn't believe so if someone's like yeah our lease is up next year you know, okay let's talk about your right. projects and what you do no 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 it's next year we'll talk about it in june and you're like oh don't do that like, that's just the first that like, we're already behind the eight ball we're stuck yeah everything becomes fast track you're limited in design by what's available and procurable within your time frames and this that and the other and before you know it you get you get to the end and everyone's done their best, including the client, to get on as early as they realized they needed you and design designed as best they can, but they're limited by procurement times and construction times. And you get to the end and you're like, is this really what you had in mind for your brand new office that's cost you X amount of money? Possibly not sometimes. Because you've, had because... to shoehorn, you've had to shoehorn the execution. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I firmly believe that the, the design and the planning element of a project should be about 50% of the overall program. Yeah. Because as long, I mean, as, that, end, as long as you put that recipe together and you've got the ingredients, let's say you, the procurement is done and I, and I, I factor the procurement within that planning stage and everything is uh, in country and potentially on site and you have the relevant DCD or QCD approvals, the execution is the easy part. 
Mm. The handover is the easy part. It's when things are blended. It's when things are changed. It's when things are not decided and you're trying to run architecture, well, you're trying to run first fix and second fix MEP in parallel with first fix and second fix architectural and your ff &E and e in furniture haven't been signed off yet. Yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that's it. It's, it's just people don't they understand. Yeah, oh, so it's, it's 12, 14 weeks on site, depending on obviously on the size and things like that. Yeah, it is. But there's a 12 week lead time for possibly fan coils, for instance, but they don't get installed two weeks before you move into your office. They need to be there months ago. <laughs> things like that. So it's like it, it just all everything kicks into everything else and shuffles you back and and to be honest, the, the clients understand it very quickly when you outline it. It's like, yeah, if you want to be in on this date, you work them backwards and then they see the date they're at and then they see your hand keep moving backwards and they, they quickly understand, oh yeah, that all makes perfect sense. But like you say, you don't. You only know what you know. If you don't do construction and you're not aware of construction, then how would you ever be expected yeah. to know that? And that is a challenge. There's That's no reason the for them to know. It's yeah, there's the no reason for them to know. It's our responsibility to educate the clients, I, I, I kind of got a bit of a warm feeling there because you know when this when this goes out, it'll go on things like Facebook and it'll go on LinkedIn. Most likely, is is the one that we'll focus on because we, we all know other people in our industry and we're all talking about the same thing. And it's not the negatives that we're focusing on; it's the education to focus on the positives, so that when we are speaking to clients, it's not a case of. Uh, slow slow quick quick slow it has to be done in a, in a process multinationals should understand that more than anyone because they have processes for every single department and they know that procurement contracts whether it's real estate design and build doesn't happen overnight and if you start to mess with a, an interior design and build process and don't implement the correct process at the very beginning by assessing your real estate and assessing the company ways of working, for example, to get the correct real estate, then everything else has a domino and, and knock-on effect. So no matter what elements you put in place that we spoke about earlier for online collaboration and four-dimensional scanning, if the planning at the start hasn't been done correctly or at all, and I wouldn't say the project's deemed to fail, but it's going to make it very, very challenging. Yeah, and that's it. There's, there's the if you do the up upfront building blocks correctly and in a timely way, then yeah, it sets you up to to make the project an awful lot easier. But the the most common mistake we've had in projects is simply the client didn't realise when the first step needs needed to happen, and it just was a month, two months, three months. It just would have been great if we'd had them, but we don't. So everyone makes the best in terms of design, procurement, construction of what you can. And, and, and that's what happens. But you know, they, they, there's no reason for them to know. It's about us putting it out there and educating them that if you're thinking about moving or doing a new office a year out, it would be a good idea to get in touch with the consultant sites and say, look, we're thinking about it. And because it, it gives you that portion of time, even if you did nothing else, but understand how you work, because everyone now is changing how their office works. Mm -hmm. And a lot of designers have a lot of good information and input to give these guys, but because it's not just taking what you do now and moving it to a new location. It's an opportunity to rethink how your company works. And a lot of clients don't necessarily realize that, yeah, just because you've been doing that in this office for five years means it's the best way or the most efficient way to do it. There's a lot of thinking out there in the design world where they can help you not just have a nice office to look at, but actually make you work better and more efficiently in the space that you have. Mm. I mean, that, that the sort of the, the back to work consultancy is obviously um, becoming more popular. The, um, the workplace consultancy, because of all of the elements that we've spoken about are services that, um, that you and I are, are, are going to have to spearhead. Um, and uh, that's what makes our, our industry so exciting is that it never, ever stands still. I'm glad you concur that the office is not dead um, because that, that's our life. That's our, our lifeblood. <laughs> um, and the technology allows that, us to take our services and, and our advice and education further afield rather than just where you are and, and, and where I am, um, certainly with the multinationals. Um, I've had a 
really it's been a really good um in-depth conversation um, i hope for the first episode everyone has enjoyed it and they can uh, relate to it um, if there's any comments then please leave them uh, on the thread wherever you see this if it's uh, primarily linkedin and um graham mcgregor i will leave you to enjoy the rest of your day uh, what has the rest of the day got planned? <laughs> I'm sure you're uh, very busy uh, today, getting in yeah. my audience. Yeah, um, you've set me up massively there. Yeah. Not at all, not at all. You're a busy boy. You're working on Moroccan projects in Djibouti and, you know, absolutely. Seriously, mate, thank you so much. Um, I said at the start of the conversation that um, about our industry and about the the way that we that we met, it was one of my most successful projects it was one of my uh funniest um introductions where i had been given the contact name of uh, the wonderful kenny mccray um uh, who uh, who kindly put me in touch with uh, with zoe who kindly then put me in touch with chris aird and hope you're well chris i think chris is in saudi now enjoying himself on that huge project um of which chris and i were neighbors uh, but he was in dubai at the time which I think he had gone to university with Zoe. So this is all Scottish people, by the way. And then they introduced me to you. And then there was uh, there was um, uh, Fintan Kenny, uh, a lovely Irish gentleman that we, we both know very well, um, who, who came in at the, at the back end of the project. So it was in the sake of a day, I'd gone from uh, four to five Scottish people to a, an Irish chap at the end for this particular project, which was really good fun. I'm glad we've kept in touch. Thank you so much for joining me and um, I appreciate your time and I hope you have uh, a nice afternoon and a nice weekend. Graham McGregor, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Ross Simon. We'll see you next time on Space Design and Build. Um, thanks for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.